So, uh, welcome, uh, all those uh, citizens of the internet. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm here in the, in, in the hotel in Galway. So, so, this is a history seminar, and the topic we're discussing is Do modern Irish historians exaggerate the role of the Catholic Church uh, in independent Ireland? Uh, I've been doing some research, particularly on the tomb story, and as a result of that, I thought maybe there was uh, a need for uh, a, a, sort of a wider discussion than just the question of tune to see, uh, you know, are we at a point in Irish history where many of the citizens are left um, le left in deceit as, to, as regards the recent history, and that they, maybe there's an element to which the role of the Catholic Church has been exaggerated. So anyway, I, I'm going to speak directly to the topic, did home rule equal home rule in independent Ireland? I'll, I'll be speaking first, and then Eugene Jordan is going to be speaking particularly on the tune uh, children's home and he'll answer questions on that and I'll, I'll hopefully answer questions on that too if people uh, will want to know about it and then Rory Connor is going to talk about the various tribunals and investigations and, uh, and ask whether all of that stacks up in the way that it's supposed to so, uh, so the first topic as you can see is myself did, did Rome rule equal uh, did home rule equal Rome rule in independent Ireland and for those who don't know, I'm sure the vast majority of people understand that phrase, but for those who don't know, about 1900, 1910-ish in Ireland, there was a big political agitation, we were going to get home rule, meaning we were going to get a kind of a local independence, not full independence, but local independence. And while that agitation was going on, in the north of Ireland, <coughs> some Protestants represented it, that if we did ever get home rule, actually it would be just Rome rule. Actually, the Vatican would dominate us, the bishops would dominate us, whatever. That was, that was what they said would happen if we did get an independent Ireland. Obviously, we did get an independent Ireland, early 1920s on. And during that time, I don't think anybody ever said that it was Rome rule. Anybody who knew Ireland at the time, you know, it was a ridiculous statement. The only person who did come from the 1960s on is one Dr. Ian Paisley. And that, that was the way he always represented Ireland, uh, the, the south of Ireland, that were Rome rule, whatever. Then, curiously, after Ian Paisley dies and after the troubles end, that actually is the way people have looked on independent Ireland. They actually have said now that, that independent Ireland was dominated uh, by Rome. I think that's uh, wrong. I think it's exaggerated. I think it's false. So, so, so I thought maybe there was room to explore this subject and to see uh, what's true or not true in it. So, <clears throat> the first step uh, in this journey is to examine, presumably, the role of the various uh, Taoiseach. Obviously, the Taoiseach of Ireland are the main political powerhouse and to which the EU anyway. And, uh, and, and let's see what their attitude was and whether it justifies this Rome rule uh, thing. Now, the first Taoiseach, although he didn't have the title, uh, would be W.T. Cosgrove. <coughs> he, he, I think his, his official title would be the President of the Executive Council. Now, I'm, I'm putting him in as the first Taoiseach because he's the first sort of Prime Minister, if you like, when things settled down a little bit uh, during the Civil War. And he, he reigned then for approximately, let's say, uh, 23, 22 or 23 to 1932. <clears throat> so what was his attitude? Now, <clears throat> actually, he was a very religious person, uh, incidentally. The W.T. Cosgrove and his son, Liam Cosgrove, who later became a teacher, were very close friends uh, with Frank Duff. And those who know the history of, of Dublin and the Catholicism, if you like, uh, you know, Frank Duff looms very large. He's the founder of the Legion of Mary, and he's arguably the most Catholic figure you're going to get in Dublin for many decades. And actually, he's a very close friend of W.T. Cosgrove. So, so yes, uh, W.T. Cosgrove was very religious, uh, absolutely. But it did not mean that he in any way wished to discriminate, discriminate against non-Catholics in Ireland. So that, that's what people are making the mistake. They're taking sincere Catholics and they're presuming that they're sort of bigoted, blah, blah, blah. And that's, in my opinion, a total mistake. Now, here, for example, is, uh, <clears throat> is a letter he sent to Archbishop Gilmartin in Chum in 1931. Now, I think this is over a controversy uh, involving a, uh, a, a controversy involving uh, a librarian. Uh, there, was, there was a big row in Mayo, I think it was, uh, whereby... Uh, <clears throat> whereby some people objected to a Protestant librarian in a, in a largely Catholic town in the west of Ireland. And uh, uh, the about... Uh, <laughs> it's actually not big time today. <laughs> anyway, if you read that quote, hopefully I can get it up somehow or other, uh, you'll see that... Um, <laughs> yeah, but... Good first one. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, well... Yeah, yeah, here it is. Yeah. 
So, as I explained to your grace at our interview, to discriminate against any citizen or to exercise a preference for a citizen on account of religious belief would be to conflict with some of the fundamental principles on which this state is founded. Now, I think that's a very clear statement, and you can read that in his letter to Archbishop Kilmartin. I take that from the actual image of the letter that you'll see in uh, Michael Affin's book on uh, W.D. Cosgrove. He brought out a book not long ago full of pictures of the letters of, of W.D. Cosgrove, and you get that in it. And another example you can take from the, the, the Taoiseach ship of, um, of W.T. Cosgrove would be the very early point in it. I think it's 1923, um, the, uh, the Vatican sent down an emissary. <clears throat> he was going to sort of solve the civil war and bring both sides together, etc., etc. It was uh, an envoy from the Vatican, a very senior uh, position. And uh, the Irish government effectively told him to get lost. If you look at the account of that, that's what happened. W.T. Cosgrove, the whole Irish government said, no way are you having any role to play politically, just mind your own business. And they, they went back to the Vatican and got him withdrawn. And I, I think that that's a fair description of, of that uh, in, in history. So that, that's W.T. Cosgrove. That's our first um, uh, Taoiseach, effectively, as I say. He didn't have the title, but he was, but that, that was his approach. Now we come to, obviously, Eamon de Valera. <coughs> the, um, following each Taoiseach in, in, in succession, uh, who, who came in in 1932 and hardly ever went away. <laughs> anyway... <coughs> De, de Valera, I, I'm gonna, obviously it's a very long career and I'll be here forever talking about it, but I thought I would highlight uh, three things particularly in the long career of, of De Valera on this question. Now the first point, which people seem to forget, is that during the Civil War, uh, Eamon de Valera was excommunicated by the Catholic Church. People forget that. All the people who opposed the state during the Civil War were excommunicated. It's a very definitive statement for the Irish bishops. And here you see Dan Breen, uh, a well-known Fidel Fall TD, uh, talking about it after, uh, in after years. He said the civil war was bad, but it saved us this much. It saved us from government of Manut. The people were split on the issue of the treaty, but the hierarchy went out and attacked the republic, threw bell, book, and candle at it in nearly every pulpit in the country. And they drove one half of the people against them, with the result that they never regained the power they once had. Now I think you can take from, you can see how important it was, the excommunication of the republican side in the civil war from that. And I think you can see the kind of resentment that went through that side of the Civil War all throughout. You know, they, they were never going to take listen to bishops all that much because they had been excommunicated back in the day, as I say, including De Valera. And the, and the one point that I, the one simple point I would make to you is that a lot of these people wrote their memoirs later. Dan Breen was one of the first. I mean, and you can obviously read them now in the witness statements in the National Archives. A huge collection. Now, I'll put it to you. You will very rarely or never read an account in those witness statements that, that said that any Republican modified his views or his political actions because they were excommunicated by the church. If you read down through it, you, you know, that, that, doesn't, that never happens. You know, they, they just went on and did whatever they were going to do politically. They ignored uh, what the bishops did in, uh, in excommunicating them. Now, that being the case, that's definitive proof that they were not the type of people to modify their political activities just because the bishop said X or Y about them. If you think about it, that's definitively, you know, explains that. So anyway, De Valera was one of those people excommunicated by the Catholic Church. It was not said by anybody that he did anything differently after he was excommunicated than before he was excommunicated. It didn't no effect on his political uh, activities. So I, I thought that was an, an important point. Now, the second issue I wish to bring out on the question of De Valera, and it's one that you can't avoid, is the question of <clears throat> the Constitution. Now, <clears throat> now, it's often been alleged, now this is the kind of mythology of the thing, the, 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 that the Constitution was very heavily influenced by this man here, <coughs> Dr. John Charles uh, McQuaid, and that he basically wrote it, blah, blah, blah. Now, the fact of the matter is that this is one, one area where a lot of research has gone into it uh, in recent years. You can, you can read many books in the last 10, 20 years on the making of the Irish Constitution. And in that, they absolutely are saying now, no, the Catholic Church, none of them had all that much influence in any part of the Constitution. Now, to, to, to clarify, he did consult a number of church figures. He consulted uh, uh, Dr., uh, sorry, Father Cahill, who was a Jesuit. He consulted Father Dennis Cah uh, Fahey. Now, <coughs> Father Fahey was a priest of the Holy Ghost Order, as well as Dr. McQuaid. And the Holy Ghost Order uh, ran Blackrock College. So if you, if you want to know about Eamon de Valera and his clerical links, uh, Blackrock College is the place uh, you want to focus in on. 
So th that's how he would have met Dennis Fahey, and that's how he knew uh, Dr. McQuaid. <clears throat> so he consulted them. Uh, and in the case of McQuaid, it's true that McQuaid had some influence on uh, a number of different areas to do with rights, I think family rights. It sometimes claimed that the overall claim to the national territory might have been influenced by him. Uh, McQuaid came from Cav, not too far from the border, and in an area where there's lots of Protestants and Catholics, and he kind of had a, a sort of northern Catholic flavour to him. Anyway, the point is that, it, 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 by the way, in the Constitution, you do have a preface that's clearly Christian. Now, I think, I think the source of that was, was elsewhere as well, rather than McQuaid. But definitely, we do have a preface. It's still there. But when it comes to the religious clauses in the Constitution, uh, McQuaid and those two other priests had no influence at all on it, surprisingly. It, you see, so what happened was, it, McQuaid, de Valera had McQuaid going through all these different rights, like the rights of property, etc., etc. And even at one point, he sent uh, McQuaid a draft of the Constitution. And he left the, the religious clauses blank. It's quite interesting. And then, uh, at some point, McQuaid went to visit him. And there, and there he showed him the religious clauses in the Constitution. And McQuaid was enraged. Uh, you know, and he had to apologise then a, a few days later. Uh, he was enraged. The Vatican was very unhappy. And Father uh, Cal and Father Dennis Fahey campaigned for about 10 or 20 years afterwards to try to get us what they would consider a Catholic Constitution because they were so enraged with the Constitution. The point is that the religious clauses that he came up with, De Valera, were one, he stated that the Catholic Church had a special position in art, and that's it. And then he went on in the next clause to say that also we recognize the, the Church of Ireland, the Jewish faith, uh, Methodist, etc., etc. So this meant nothing. It, it just meant nothing. It seemed to, to, to put the Catholic Church in the same line as all these other religions, much to the annoyance even of the Vatican. So, so, so in fact, we didn't get a Catholic institution or a constitution, and, uh, and a lot of people complain bitterly about that. So, that's I, I just thought I needed to address when I talk about De Valera and Rome rule, etc. We need to talk about the constitution. And as I say, the modern thinking is it wasn't much influenced by the Catholic Church, at least uh, outside of some issues relating to rights and families and whatever. With, with, with there was some influence there, but otherwise, uh, not much. Now, the third issue I want to address uh, with respect to De Valera was to talk about those two guys again. So that's Dr. John Charles McQuay. Now, again, he looms large when people are going to talk about Cap uh, the influence of the Catholic Church uh, in the independent army. Dr. John Charles McQuay and this guy, uh, Michael Brown, <coughs> the, um, the Bishop of Galway and the, and the builder of the very fine cathedral that's in this city. Now, those two figures, now if you were to talk about the modern mythology, if you like, of the Catholic Church supposedly dominating independent Ireland, those are the two people we're going to hear an awful lot about. Dr. John Charles McQuaid and, and uh, Michael Brown in Galway. Now, the point I was trying to bring out about this is, is this quote you can see in John Cooney's uh, biography of John Charles McQuaid. Now, in that, you can see that, in fact, uh, it seems that de Valera himself was responsible for the appointment of both people as bishops. You can see there where it says, his de Valera's proactive policy had helped secure the promotion of Benut Professor Michael Brown, known as Cross Michael to Galway in 1937, and the Derek Priest Neil Farrell to Reform in early 1939. So that's de Valera's policy to get those appointed. Now, de Valera instructed the Secretary of the Department of External Affairs, Joe Walsh, to inform the Vatican authorities of their uh, views. Walsh, in turn, instructed the head of the Irish Legation to Holy See, uh, his former Congress people, uh, William Babington Macaulay, to press the case for McQuaid, who was to be codenamed X in secret correspondence between Dublin and Rome. Now, that correspondence, so the whole Megillah of de Valera's pushing to get McQuaid uh, appointed as the Archbishop, went on for a very long time. And it was a very, it was massive amounts of lobbying by de Valera of Rome to get McQuaid appointed. He was definitely the man to appoint McQuaid to the Archbishop. And as you can see, he seemed to be the same uh, role in appointing Michael Brown to call it. Now, so I would like to put the question to you then. If it is the case that De Valera was the man responsible for appointing Michael Brown to Galway and McQuaid to Dublin, then surely you're not talking about the church dominating the state. You're talking about the state dominating the church. It's not the logical way to look at it. I mean, if he, if he, if he was responsible for appointing those guys... They, then that kind of blows the whole myth out of the water. But supposedly McQuaid, you know, is the puppet master, and De Valera is the, you know, is his underling. When you look at that, you reckon it's the other way around. 
And I, I think it was the other way around. In many, many areas of, of Irish life, you will find Fianna Fáil and the government dominating some aspects of the church and indeed exploiting them, realistically exploiting them. And by the way, it does come up a little bit in the tune hall. There was a reference where um, the religious order uh, moved the, the head of the, of the tune hall. I think it's about 1952. And in response, in, in, I think it's Galway County Council, they were saying, oh, we have to get that reversed. We've got to get her appointed again or whatever. And it seemed to be that they expected to be able to manipulate the appointments within the religious orders. So that's an agenda that people are not talking about. The degree to which the state dominated the church in those years exploited them. But I think you could make quite a case about that. And I think that, that that's an evidence there in the question of devil there and, the, and these appointments. So that's, that's just what I want to talk about, Devil Ayer, those, those three uh, issues there. Next, you come along to uh, John A. Costello. So John A. Costello uh, was a famous barrister. Uh, he, uh, <coughs> he famously, he was on the opposite side to Patrick Cavanaugh in a big court case. And, and he's, he's the only figure along here who really doesn't have a major role in the War of Independence in that period. He was just working as a barrister. It, it used to be said that in 1916 he came up to one of the checkpoints on his way to play golf. And uh, he was very annoyed that he couldn't play golf on 1916. Anyway, but, but he was uh, a very highly respected um, uh, Taoiseach of Ireland, uh, anyway, under the two inter-party governments. Uh, now let's have a look at uh, what they say about him. <coughs> they, this is from the biography of John A. Costello, uh, came out that long ago, by uh, David McCullough. David McCullough, that's the, uh, the broadcaster. He, he, you'll see him on private time uh, on RTE. And, and he's just describing there... A visit, I presume that's a visit, from, by John A. Costello to uh, Rome. And I think in this case they're particularly referring to Trinity College. And you'll see there that later Costello met a senior Vatican official, Monsignor Domenico Tardini, the pro secretary of state in charge of extraordinary affairs. Tardini pointed out that the Irish government accorded very favourable treatment to non Catholics, which contrasted the way Catholics were persecuted in North. And Costello explained to him <coughs> explained that the government gave fair treatment to non-Catholics both on general principles and also in the interest of future unity. Obviously, he's referring there to the Protestant majority in the North. But that tells you again, that's a quote very much like Dr. D. Cusker, that was the policy of the government, fair treatment to non-Catholics. And I, and I think, you know, the, the, that's a gen genuine statement. And as I say, I think it's particularly in reference to Trinity College. The Vatican was very interested in the kind of promotion of Trinity College by the Irish state. At that time, and up to 1970, Catholics couldn't even officially attend Trinity College, so you had to get a dispensation. Uh, so it was, it was such a, a strong Protestant ethos. And yet, it appointed three TDs uh, to, to, the, uh, <clears throat> to the Parliament up to 1937, and appointed three senators uh, from that time on and nowadays. So, so, and then, of course, as, as a university, it was subsidised by the state in many cases as well. So, so the Vatican couldn't understand why the Irish government would want to subsidise an institution that was so, so blatantly anti-Catholic. And that's what he had to explain there, that it was their policy to treat uh, non-Catholics uh, fairly. So that's, that's uh, Johnny Costello's next teacher. And obviously succeeding him <coughs> is uh, Sean Lamass. Uh, Sean, Sean Lamass um, had, had quite a role to, 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 during the War of Independence and was famously... Eamon de Valera's number two man uh, virtually throughout uh, in Fianna Fáil. Now, the Irish Times <coughs> published a supplement uh, a couple of years ago uh, giving his uh, memoirs. The, the, these are apparently tapes that were discovered not long ago and he gave us some of his uh, thoughts on the tapes. And, uh, and here, here, for example, is a, a quote from one of them. And I think there was political advantage in having a certain anti-clerical uh, tinge the only time in my life that I ever got an enormous vote, the highest vote ever recorded to any candidate in the general election, was when I was having a full-scale row with the Bishop of Galway. And this was dominating the political scene. And I found this in other occasions too, that having a good row with the Bishop is quite a political asset and you don't suffer for politically for it because of an anti clericism in the Irish people. So he had no problem in having a go uh, at bishops. And in fact, he did it, it seems, deliberately for his political advantage. So this idea that the bishops are dominating the, uh, you know, uh, dominate the political class doesn't seem at all the case. In fact, in many cases, the opposite. They, they, they make the bishops the fall guys, as, as he was doing there. And, he, and here's another quote from his members. <clears throat> so, I do not remember having any difficulty, sense of strain, or problems in dealing with the church. 
My personal relationship with all the principal archbishops and the cardinal was always good. <clears throat> Whenever I wanted advice about anything, there was never the slightest suggestion that they felt it was their duty to impose any point of view upon us. I could have been lucky. Uh, nothing emerged in my time that would have raised a conflict. I can only testify on my personal experience in that regard. So he's saying definitively there in his memoirs, take memoirs, uh, he, he, he died not all that long after he, after he was teaching, that in fact it was not the case that the church in any way, shape or form dominated the state. That's very clearly uh, what he's saying there. Now he's saying it's through his personal experience, but as well as being Taoiseach, as I say, he was number two to Devil Air from 1932 on. I mean, it, it's incredible what experience you're talking about. So somebody like him is 40, 50 years of that chunk of independent Ireland uh, to build on. And that was what he was saying was the case. So I thought, we, uh, so there are the t shirts. When, when you're past uh, La Masse, you're into Jack Lynch, and then you're into very modern time. So I think that kind of covers the period that people think we have some sort of Catholic dictatorship. So that, there were the t shirts. And, and you could look at a few other institutions as well. These are the presidents of Ireland. I noticed that uh, two of the first presidents of Ireland um, were Protestants. Uh, as you can see there, Douglas Hyde and Erskine uh, Childers. And, and, like, and it was a significant statement for the Irish government to appoint Douglas Hyde to, to be the first president. I mean, it, it's, it's quite a noticeable thing. You know, and it, he, he then, uh, you know, when he was inaugurated, they had three religious ceremonies. One was in the Pro Cathedral at the end of David Irwin. Was that that? And then they had another uh, ceremony, I think simultaneously, in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, which is, of course, the Church of Ireland. And Douglas Hyde uh, sat in the seat of the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, i.e. the Viceroy of Ireland. I mean, it's very interesting, it's very significant that he would occupy you know, the same position as the old British Viceroy of Ireland. And of course, that's in the Scottish Cathedral, because it's the Church of Ireland. And then simultaneously, there was also a Jewish, Jewish ceremony held uh, welcoming in the new president. So you can see from that the degree to which the Irish government was very conscious of bringing along its minority faiths, and to, to what extent its minority faiths were given, you know, very much a hallowed place in Irish society. It was not remotely the case that they were bulldozed out of it like some people uh, claim was happening. So, and then, and another institution you could talk about is the judiciary. <coughs> so here's just a, a little quote from the, the DNB, or sorry, the, um, the Irish uh, for the recent uh, Dictionary of Irish Biography, on Timothy Sullivan, who's the first president of the Irish High Court, and you can see his dates there, the 20s and 30s. And said, throughout his tenure, uh, Sullivan presided over a high court whose membership of six was equally divided between judges of nationalist and unionist background. So in fact, the judiciary at that time, that would be the first couple of decades, you have half the nationalists and half the unionists, presumably that half, half Protestant. So I mean, that's obviously not an institution and dominated by the Catholic Church. And you could throw in a few names there, T.C. Kingsmill uh, Moore, on the Supreme Court and the High Court, and son of a Protestant minister, James Creed Meredith. Now, they appointed him the president of the Dáil Supreme Court, 1920 to 22, meaning the underground uh, courts that they had founded. So it's very interesting that before independence, you know, the Irish, the Dáil underground system, he was appointed the head of as the president of that Supreme Court. And then he was on the High Court and the uh, Supreme Court, uh, and he's Protestant. And Gerald Fitzgibbon <coughs> was a judge of the Supreme Court. He was quite a very important and influential judge of the Supreme Court uh, from 1924 to 38. And he and the then Chief Justice used to, you know, be at loggerheads. The fellow called Kennedy was the Chief Justice. Uh, but, but it was very important. And actually, the Supreme Court had some, I think, rather surprising decisions in those years and a little later uh, in, in favour of Protestants in some, in some respects. So that's the, the judiciary. Yeah, here's just the Lord Mayor's of Dublin. I thought people might be interested in. So for 1960s, 57s, 61 62, you had Robert Briscoe, who was the Lord Mayor of Dublin, and, and 60 to 61, you had Morris Stockwell, who was Protestant, and Robert Briscoe was Jewish. And when, and when he took office in 1956, here's just a quote from him. In Ireland, at least, there was absolute tolerance. And in this Catholic country, a man of faith could have the goodwill of his citizens he did, if he deserved it and was prepared to give service to his fellow citizens. So that's his opinion, as a Jewish person. In our 1956, there was absolute tolerance. And he was a senior figure in Fianna Fáil as well, a known figure in Fianna Fáil, and I think he was his son as well. And, uh, you know, so no problem uh, been either Fianna Fáil uh, being Protestant or, or Jewish in this case, uh, and holding senior office in Ireland. Now, 
having moved away from just these institutions, the, the policies of the Taoiseach, which is obviously the most important thing in determining what was the policy in Ireland, and then looking at a few institutions, maybe it might be interesting to, to look at some of the different sectors <coughs> in terms of the policies. So here's just a quote about healthcare. Now, this was a proposal in 1959 to, to amalgamate some of the big Dublin hospitals into a voluntary hospital system. And they just list some of the hospitals. So Sir Patrick Stone's, Mercer's, National, National Children's Hospital, Harcourt Street, Mead, Bagger Street, Stevens and Adelaide. Now, some of the great names of Dublin hospitals. Or not, not all of them, but some of the great names. Now, as he, as he points out there, I'll just read the quote. With the exception of the Mead, they could all be referred to as Protestant hospitals, controlled by Protestants and largely staffed by Protestant uh, doctors. So as you can see, that very impressive list of Dublin hospitals, and it's not all of the, of the Protestant Dublin hospitals, were totally dominated by the... You, you couldn't get in there if you were a Catholic, at least as a doctor. And, and that's as late as 1959. Now, how is that compatible with this idea that we lived in a Catholic dictatorship, blah, blah, blah? Obviously, they let the, the Protestants run their own system in, in the hospitals. Now, the other area to look at, then, is education. <clears throat> Now, education is, is quite, a, quite a, a, an interesting subject, and I think it's become a, a little controversial subject uh, nowadays. So I think maybe it might help to talk about what is the policy and education as regards religion in Ireland in those years. And what you'll find, I would say, totally for independent Ireland of the 20th century, is that they follow an education policy determined in the 19th century. They, they left it unchanged. They came in, to, took office uh, when the Irish state came in, and they never changed this policy. It's amazing. Now, why? Because it was a matter of great debate in the 19th century. It's a huge issue. You're talking 1820s, 30s, 40s, the bringing in of the national school system, and then in the 1840s, the Queen's Colleges. The national school system the first, would be first level, Queen's Colleges, third level. In both those cases, huge routes. Because the state was trying to impose a kind of a national state-run system in the national school system. The Catholic Church objected. You, it was a Protestant state after all. Uh, you know, you had the Church of Ireland, was the official Protestant religion. They felt they were going to get kind of brainwashed by the state in this case, so massive objections. So, for example, the Irish school system, in, in, the, in the Archdiocese of uh, Chu, up until the death of, um, of the then uh, Michael, the then Archbishop of Chu, they, they, there was no national schools permitted, except, by the way, in the, in the workhouse, uh, with our workhouse, because that was controlled by the state. But otherwise, he didn't permit any national schools. That shows you the kind of rows that were there. And, of course, the Queen's Colleges. The Queen's Colleges are what, what is now NUIG, uh, Queen's University of Belfast, and, U, and UCC. And uh, <clears throat> they were kind of Protestant institutions in the views of the Catholics. So a huge row, boycotting of them, blah, blah, blah. So the, 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 this came into a head in a, in a kind of a commission that the British government introduced about 1871, I think, called the Powers Commission. And, and, and it, now I'm not saying it was just their decisions, but in, in the few years after that, what evolved was a system whereby the British said to the Irish authorities, uh, to the Irish faiths, he said, okay, you, you build your, uh, your school, you have your college, whatever you want to do, and we'll just pay the teachers. And that's it. And you own it, and you control it, and you can put whatever gloss you want, you teach whatever religion you want. So if you're the Methodist school of Ireland, you set up a Methodist school for all your people, no problem, the state will pay the teachers. And, and of course, there is, there is a curriculum, uh, an interest search and then a legal search, and of course, there's also uh, particular examples from the universities. But apart from that, the state did not control the schools. They, they were owned and run and built by the religious orders uh, and managed by the religious orders, and of course, still are. So that was the policy. In other words, the British government you know, flew up the white flag in education. It's absolutely fascinating. They just said to them, okay, look, you, you, you do what you want to do in these schools. We'll continue to pay the teachers. That what you can put whatever you want, your history, your religion, and you, you can teach whatever you want. If you're the Christian brothers, you, you control uh, uh, that aspect of the curriculum. So, come the Irish state, they follow the same policy. Now, uh, so in other words, it's laissez-faire. You, you, you are whoever you are, whatever church you are, or, or, not, or not a church, as, as we can see later. You, you build your school, we'll, we'll pay the teachers. And it was just, it was just totally laissez for totally liberal policy, actually. And, and so the Irish government continued on that policy, right, uh, after independence. And, th and this is what led to the situation where, in Ireland, we are the first country, I think, in Western Europe 
to have, um, a, have state-paid state teachers in a Muslim school. I think that's about 1990 in, in Kalski. And then about 1979, they set up the Educate Together schools, which would be kind of atheist schools, effectively. And all of them are paid, the teachers are paid by the Irish state, no problem at all. And then in about, I think it's 1930-something, you've got um, a Jewish national school set up in the southern city, and after that you've got a Jewish secondary school. All, no problem, state pays the teachers, they can teach whatever they like, religion, etc. And of course that's true of all the Protestant faiths, they have all their own schools, no, no issue whatsoever. So you can see there, in this quote, I think this is a senator, an Irish senator speaking there, from 1964, and he just pointed out that we in Ireland are justly proud of our school system, uh, he continued. Scrupulous care is taken to ensure that Catholicism, Protestantism, or atheism are not imposed on any people against his will. Any denomination group can, at any time, set up its own school, and the corresponding state support is immediately made available on the basis of the number of pupils in attendance. It's a totally lousy purpose. It's a very liberal policy. It's amazing. So that was the policy. Now, for those who don't know, it's totally different in, in most of the countries of Europe. The, the state imposes its policy. If, if you talk about Spain under Franco, I mean, you, I, I think it's illegal to have uh, Protestant schools. I'm off with so much. <laughs> anyway, uh, so anyway, that's the education. And you can see in that, again, it's ridiculous nonsense to talk about Catholic dictatorship. It's the complete opposite. It's a very, it's a, it's a remarkably liberal and tolerant environment. Now, I thought also I'd, I'd highlight an, other, another interesting issue. Now, obviously, during this time, there was massive discrimination against Catholics north of the border. But what I think a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, especially in employment and all that, it's a well-known fact that Catholics couldn't get jobs, whatever. That was also, to quite a degree, true of the south of Ireland. And that's what people don't seem to understand. There was discrimination against Catholics, quite a lot of it, in the south of Ireland in, in those years. So there's Guinness, you've obviously heard of it. Uh, it was boasted about one of the biggest companies in the world in, in its day. And, and its day was still all 20th century Ireland. It's still a very big company, a very big employer. And uh, it, they actively discriminated against Catholics. It's a well-known fact around Dublin. You know, and it was just a quote from the Irish Independent there. It, Guinness, had no qualms about selling drink to Catholics, but it did everything it could to avoid deploying them until the 1960s. The blatant discrimination continued far longer than it should have. So you have up to the 1960s, now that's 40 years after Irish independence, and I think it's probably the biggest company in Dublin, is openly discriminating against Catholics. Now how do you square that with this Catholic dictatorship stuff uh, that people go on about? Now they did, and here's another institution to give an example of anti-Catholic discrimination in South Ireland. That's the Rotunda. Now uh, the, the Rotunda is um, probably the most prestigious of the, of the Dublin hospitals. It was founded in 1745, and it's still on the same site. And when they founded it, they found a system called Masters. I've forgotten how long a Master is, maybe it's seven years or whatever, that a Master is, is in charge of it. From 1745 until, guess what date, uh, there was no Catholic Master. Does anybody want to hazard a guess? It's 1995. The first Catholic Master of the Rotunda Hospital is not to 1995. Now I'll ask you, how can that be? When you consider that in the 1960s, I think it was, uh, the, Irish, the Southern Irish state had 95% Catholics. It was a 95% Catholic state. And that institution, an important and big institution, would have no Catholic master until 1995. Now, I find that amazing. Um, and, it, and here is Bank of Ireland, a similar story. Uh, the, the first, uh, and, and that was well known to discriminate against Catholics. It's not... You know, that is an accident. These people are run, the higher managers are run by Protestants. These are Protestant institutions, but very large, important institutions. It's obviously it's the Bank of Ireland's former House of Lords building there in Dublin. Founded in 1783. The first Catholic CEO of the Bank of Ireland is not until 1991. Long, you know, it's an amazing fact, I think. And uh, it's Trinity College, the same story. Founded in 1592. The first Catholic, uh, it was a provost, I think you call it, uh, of Trinity, uh, not to 1991. So I think it's Tom Mitchell. Uh, so it's not remarkable. I mean, it's, it's incredible. All throughout the independent Irish state, nobody said to them, excuse me, you can't discriminate against Catholics. Because they did, obviously they did discriminate. And it's the Irish Times, founded 1859, and the first Catholic editor, not to 1986. So I think when you look at those kind of institutions, and you can see how they systematically excluded Catholics, again, 
you can see how much of a nonsense it is to talk about some kind of Catholic dictatorship. 